Samuel 15. And we actually talked about these verses uh, a few months ago. Um, but there was something completely different in here that we're going with. And if you read Exodus 20, then you'll, you'll have it figured out. But, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What is this? What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep, oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, Wait and let me tip. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agag, king, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, the sheep, the ox, and the choice of the things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And Samuel said, As the Lord is much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed in the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you from being king. And all, well, we all remember this story, right? God had sent word to, to Saul to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites, which he did not do. He saved some of the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to God and the king. Brings all that back. Samuel shows up and basically tells him that the kingdom has been taken away from you because of your disobedience. Right? We, we talked about this already. But let's, let's look again at verse 22 and 23. And Samuel said, As the Lord has much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Does your Bible read like this? Does the Lord delight as much in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? The command of the Lord. The, command of the, Lord, the voice of the Lord, whatever the, whatever is coming out of the Lord's mouth, is it better to obey what God is saying or to keep the commandments and all that it is instructed? Is it significant that, that Saul keeps referring to the Lord your God? Your God. He is the man of God. He's the prophet of Israel. Samuel. Samuel. Typically, typically, there was like one prophet in the land, and he is, he's it. So to, in the eyes of the people, he is the connection outside of the Levites and the priests who were doing the sacrifices, realizing that once a year, and we're coming up on that time, Passover, when the priest would slaughter the pure, right, take the blood, of the heifer go in and apply it at the mercy seat once a year for the sin of all the people. We're coming upon that, but that's what Jesus did for us. He was the pure, the, she, the the lamb of God that was slain for you and I, and that's what we're about to celebrate that we call Easter. I actually like to refer to it as Passover and Resurrection Sunday myself, just because Easter has a lot of, of uh, it can have uh, a lot of corruption just in the name of what it comes from the goddess of fertility, and so on and so forth. It's resurrection of Jesus. That's what we celebrate, what we call Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. There have been a lot of gods on this earth that people have worshipped, but there's only been one that died for the people and rose from the grave, and that's Jesus. You know, thanks be to God for that day, that third morning when Christ rose from the grave. So, thanks be to Jesus. But yeah, in my opinion, that's what he's, the Lord your God, he is the prophet of, of God in the land. But he was coming back to sacrifice, but yet he did not obey. Good intentions, 
How important are good intentions when it goes against what God has already said? In other words, how many times in our lives have God spoken something to us or through whatever and we know something's from God to do, but yet this does better over here. You know, our intentions, His intentions, but yet He was in disobedience to the very word that God had spoken. How many times have we done a similar thing? When our intentions went against what God had originally said to do. But he says, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Okay, the last part there, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Does your Bible read like that? What does the next phrase say? To listen, to heed. What does it mean to listen to something, to someone? To hear them, right? To listen, to take heed to what God is saying. How many times have we heard preaching that we did not take heed to? And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about growing up through, through how many years of sermons have we heard that we did not heed to? How many people have problems all across America that did not heed to what they had been taught as a child. And if we had taken heed to what we had learned, how many people would not be sitting in prison right now? 99.9%? Because .9 we learned what we should have been doing, but we didn't take heed to, did not obey what was said. A lot of stuff is, is, is preached all across this land, but and a lot of stuff's from God, but if people don't take heed, what's the point? Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of, what does your Bible say there? Witchcraft. 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 Mm -hmm. What is witchcraft? In your mind's eye, when somebody says that's witchcraft, what does that mean to you? Which verse are you? I'm in 23. Idolatry. Okay. For rebellion is as for a sin like divination. 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 Which is rebellion is the problem. Is carrying out. Yeah, idolatry is the second one. Seeking knowledge of the future and the unknown by supernatural means. Witchcraft. Divination. Witchcraft. Just carrying out the work of the devil. Okay. Intentional, in other words, putting him as their Lord and serving him. Okay, it, it's anything contrary to the Word of God, basically. Because right. so if you're not serving God, you're serving the devil. the devil. What did you just, What? how did you put it, Ms. Mary Beth? I, I did the Kindle definition. It says that it did a divination, that's the right side? Right, divination. The practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the unknown by supernatural means. Rebellion is as, some of your Bibles are going to say divination, some of them are going to say witchcraft. Some of them, uh, divination. Seeking out by means that are not of God. Mine has witchcraft and over the side in the times is divination. Witchcraft is going to be the similar thing of seeking out something other than what God is saying. So Seeking help from a demon is really bad, just as bad as the witchcraft. See, we would say if, if we if we heard, okay, just just hypothetically, if we heard that up the road, around the corner, there was a coven of witches tonight that were doing a séance around a fire, conjuring up their whatever they're doing to their demon that they're doing. Okay, we would all go, ooh, right. Oof. <clears throat> but yet, when someone's in rebellion against God, you realize, according to what he's saying here, it's equally as bad. But we look at, and we say, wow, witchcraft, oof, oof. But yet, when we see full-on rebellion toward God, we say, well, people are going to hell. And in our eyes, it's not on the same level 
And he says, The first before, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey, now we're talking about obedience. Obedience is better than sacrificing. The very thing that, that brought the forgiveness to the people. Obedience is better than that. And to heed, to listen, <coughs> is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination or witchcraft. And insubordination, y'all's Bibles may read a little differently. How are you doing? Sir? Is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. First Samuel 15, that's verse 23. What does your Bible say there in verse 23? For rebellion is as a sin of divination or witchcraft, and stubbornness. Stubbornness. What did you say? Arrogance. Arrogance. Anybody read anything other than that? Presumption. Well, how much of that goes on around us? Presuming. A presumption. I presume it's okay. I don't know. Because... <laughs> but I'm not you. Well, you said how much of that goes on around us? I said a lot of it, I presume. Insubordination, stubbornness, assumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Did y'all say iniquity and idolatry? Idolatry. Idolatry. Okay. What is idolatry? Again, in your definition, what is idolatry? Worshiping an idol. Worshiping something other than Jehovah God. Okay, worshiping, does that mean you bow into it? Or does that mean... It means everything that's entailed in that. It means you're... Serving it. The primary focus. Okay. It doesn't necessarily just bowing before. It could be it's your primary focus. The Almighty Dollar. The Almighty Dollar, he says. I happen to have a hundred dollar bill in my pocket. And a twenty dollar bill in my pocket. On purpose. Hundred dollar bill, right? Idolatry. Does idolatry just mean that I go and I bow before something? Is that just idolatry? The New Testament says greed is idolatry. Okay. We'll get there in a minute. But yes. Idolatry. We think of an idol. We think of someone took a piece of wood and they fashioned it, and they carved it, and they made some statue of something out of somebody, right? Or something. And they take it, and they put it in a hole somewhere, and they take some fruit, and they put the fruit in front of it, and burn some incense, and that's idolatry in our mind. That ain't the way it is. Which it is. And it is. A lot of people, millions upon millions, if not billions of people, do that very thing. It's a piece of stone or a piece of metal or a piece of wood or something like that. Maybe plastic even. And they fashion it and they form it into a form of something. <coughs> it, could be, it could be a whole lot of stuff with idols. And they take them and they put them in, in a hole somewhere or out on the open and they take fruit or food and they put it in front of it. They may even light some incense and Say a few prayers in front of that. It's a piece of wood. This is a piece of wood. This is actually chestnut wood right here. I've had this stick since I was, I think, 15 years old. So, 23 years, almost 24 years this year. It's a piece of wood. If I take this, and let's say that this was in the form, or it's a piece of stick, okay? And I take this stick here, and I bow before that stick and say, Oh, mighty stick, help me, oh, mighty stick. What can that stick do for me? It can help you when you walk. You like to pray. <laughs> it's a stick. What can it do for me? Can it hear me? Can it answer me? Only in the hand of someone else. <laughs> what can this do? 
And I know this is a stupid question for you and I. Yes, sir. Um, like the when they built that gold man and every person had to uh, worship it. Yeah, the golden calf. That's what you're talking about. Or Moses and the golden calf. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. That's what you're referring to. Nebuchadnezzar built a statue of himself and had all the people bow down and worship it, right? Because it represented him. And everyone that did not bow down to it, what happened? They were thrown into the fiery furnace, weren't they? Mm -hmm. That's right. And we would look at that or this and we would say we would never, ever pray to that, wouldn't we? That's just stupid. What can it do for me? We get people all over the world bow down in front of stuff that's made very similar to this in the same similar fashion. Somebody takes stone or they take wood or they take plastic or they take metal and they form it in fashion <coughs> into the form of something and they put it here and it represents their God. Have you ever been in a home where yes, you saw that? Yes, ma'am. It was so frightening to me when we were out witnessing it. Into this home where we, we knew that they were idol worshippers, but when we went in, we actually saw this form that they were worshiping. This they had it in the form of a likeness of man. Yes, ma'am. The round man. In their living room, where you could see it, where they could yes, ma'am. Show it to you. It represents what they believe in. Mm -hmm. But it gave, it gave me an eerie feeling because I knew that I was in the presence of something that God was not really, really lacking. Absolutely. Exodus chapter twenty, verse four. Y'all, many of us read it, right? What does it say? Shall not have what? Any graven? Or carved? Do you have it pulled up, Dustin? Yeah. What does it read? You shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third the fourth generation of those who hate. You shall not have a carved image. Some of your versions are going to read graven image. Okay? You shall not have any carved graven image. In other words, don't have a form that represents who God is. He wants you to worship in spirit and in truth, not in front of a thing that represents Him. But yet, people all over the world bow down in front of sticks and stones and metals and all sorts of stuff and cry out to it. Can it hear? No. Can it answer? No. Remember Elijah on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18, I believe it is, on Mount Carmel, and there's 450 prophets of Baal. And he taunts them and tells them, you know, he's telling them to cry a little louder, cut yourself a little harder. They're cutting themselves, trying to get the attention of their God to answer with fire. What happened? Nothing. Why? Because he's not real. He's the figment of someone's imagination. But yet, there were thousands upon thousands of people that believed it. Even the people of Israel that worshipped the true God fell away from worshipping the true God to worship the form of another God that was not real. Even today it happens all over the world. People are worshiping forms of what they believe is deity to them. They believe, like she was talking about, that some this form of this man created everything that we have. Well, someone created him. Someone came up with him. Someone fashioned him for the first time and formed him and said, here, we're going to worship this. And there's so many scriptures in the Bible that I'm not going to take time to read, but there's so many stories like Gideon, where Gideon did what God told him, and then he made an ephod, and it became a, a stumbling block to all of Israel. Or, is it Micah, the prophet, that had his own ephod made? I don't remember how the story, 
But there was there's several times when people in the Bible did things and they created something and it became a stumbling block to the people because they now worshipped the brazen serpent. That. What did he call it? He Ephod. Ephod. Which is what the priest wore in when God would speak it would light up. It had all the twelve stones that represented the twelve tribes of Israel. And they made one and they ended up worshiping this thing because of what it represented. The brazen serpent. A crucifix. For some people that can be an idol because they worship that. Jesus is not on the cross. Yes, he was on the cross. Wearing a cross around your neck, I don't believe personally is idolatry. But can it turn into that for some people? <coughs> you go into a Catholic church and there's all these statues of the saints. And yes. And there's Jesus on the cross. There he is. There he is. Where's he at right now? On the cross. He's not on the cross. You realize he was only on the cross for just a short amount of time? A few hours? But yes, for some people in some religions, it has turned into an idol worship. We worship that thing more than the, the one who was on there. That's why... Even today, uh, my mom has a great nephew that went to Israel. He came back and went to his grandfather's house and started taking out everything that had any representation of who Jesus was and turning it over and taking it out. Because the Bible says to have no graven image, in other words, no representation of what he is and who he is, and he, he came back from Israel um, and, and went through his right memo? Yes, he as associated that that they would be worshiping right. that. Right. And when he left, all these things were sitting out on the back walk way. That's right. He was getting them out of the house. He got them everything like... <laughs> A little bird, a little something that she had, you know, just a little thing that was just a trinket. And to him, it was inappropriate. Yes, ma'am. But instead of saying anything or doing anything, he just secretly went and got everything he could find that was looking like a picture and in some ways, I understand why he did that in some ways, but... It's kind of like the food, if it's, if it's offensive to someone, then we don't eat it. You know, where we're taught, everything is acceptable. But if you're going to, if something I'm eating in front of you is offensive to you... I don't eat it in front of you. Right. Is it the same thing with... Well, it's, it's a little more biblical as far as have no graven image, have no resemblance symbolic of who he is. And I understand why he did that. I do. I get it. But not that I necessarily agree. But even in that well, this, thing, this I'm this not going to bring it to your house, house right. but you're not going to come into my house and tell me I can. Right. You know, <laughs> like he knew that his papa didn't worship that mess. Yes, ma'am. He knew he shouldn't have been over I I started. stirring his boundaries. I stirred you up. <laughs> no, if they had been worshiping any idol of anything, it would have been, you know, I could have under yes, been better, but I thought it was very rude. <coughs> yes, ma'am. But Jason, can't adultery be more than worshiping an object if you if you are um, you place such importance and emphasis on money or okay. an activity then tell me what who, what is an idolater an let's idolater. start there what is an idolater Hi. somebody totally consumed by their they're focused on that object or Action or and they're not focused on on God. Anyone whose first priority is not God. 
an idolatry. You put that before God. Anyone whose first priority is not God has anything in place of God. Okay, if we're going to use that definition, how many of us fall in that definition? Is there any area of our life that anything comes before God? If we're going to use that definition outside of, of, of what's required for working, how much time did we spend doing X, Y, and Z as opposed to reading our Word and praying and spending time with God? All the time. Then let's just break it down real simple. Last I heard, now you could have to double check me here, and I hope I'm wrong, but last I heard, the average pastor... Are y'all hearing me? The average pastor in America spends less than five minutes a day praying and reading his Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get down to people. How much time does the average Christian remember? What does Christian mean to be Christ? Like, how much time does the average Christian spend reading their Bible? Because remember, reading your Bible is not prayer. We equate reading my Bible as, well, I prayed read my Bible. No, you read your Bible. How much time, and I'm not asking you to tell me in here, but if we had to answer in here tonight, how much time did we corporately, as a people, if we broke down how much time, you know, we've had 24 hours a day, times 7, that's 168, times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 13 of us in here tonight? 7 times 168. Of all those hours, could we accumulate... 13 hours? Just one hour a week? A person spent reading our Bibles and praying? Could we accumulate 10 hours a person? We sleep for 8 hours. We work for 8 hours. What do we do with our other 8? If you break that down over a lifetime, how many hours did we have of that other eight? If we work for eight, sleep for eight, there's still eight left, right? People say we don't have time. We do, we do something. What do we do with that other eight hours? We have time. We do not discipline ourselves to take the time. For What's God going to say to us on that day? He going to turn his back. He's not going to recognize us. If we don't know him, what's he going to say? Depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I never do. <coughs> but yet, there's many that will make it, but will be least in the kingdom. Now, I'm not a fan of being in the least of the kingdom if I have a choice about it, and we do have a choice. We have to draw nigh to God. What is an idolater? Who is an idolater? What is the definition of an idolater? Well, according to Miriam's Unabridged Dictionary is a worshiper of idols, a person that admires intensely and often blindly one that is not usually a subject of worship. I, I love that second definition. A person that admires intensely and often blindly. There's people that follow the stuff even blindly because they what they were taught, what they believed, what they... And they just follow. How many people in America just go to church because that's what we do? Because that's what we did, what mom and daddy did. We go to church, that's what we do. How many people, I mean, how many times have we said, well, we could just get them in church? How many times has that come out of our mouths? If they just go to church, well, going to church doesn't save anybody. Now, I realize what you're going to tell me, yes, if you go to church, you can hear 
possibly the truth. Things can happen. Absolutely, I'm with you. But going to church does not save people. Relationship with Jesus is what saves people. Amen. The blood of Jesus is what purifies not going to church. And there are a lot of people that have church idolatry. In the Bible words it this way, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. I was talking to a man this week, and I made the statement that we must preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. Not just, you know, if you break down um, denominations in America, if we said Baptist in America, what are they going to preach? Well, they're going to preach just repentance. That is what we're, they're known for, right? Pentecostal, what are they known for? They're going to preach speaking in tongues, right? That's what they're known for. Or sympathy with God or whoever, or they may even have some healing in there. The Methodists, what are they known for? What's their main? Well, they were founded on methods. That's what they were founded on. That's where the name comes from. Every denomination has its thing. What we've got to get back to is preaching the whole counsel of the Word of God. Amen. Not just, yes, it starts with repentance. It's where it starts. It's got to move from there to the whole counsel of the Word of God. It's not enough to just be saved. And we have others that are going to preach baptism. Baptism, baptism, baptism. Well, once you get baptized, it's still not over. It's it's It's... You're doing the process of getting there. Now we must have relationship and walk in relationship and in love and walk in fulfillment of the Word of God, overcoming sin. And we have others today that would say, well, it's not about the sin. It's just about calling on Jesus and it's done from their point to that point out. And then what's the point of the, the Word of God's instructions of growing and overcoming sin? And Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil's stuff. If I continue in my sin, because I mean, Jesus said, or the angel told Mary that he will come and save the people from their sins. Not in their sins, from their sins. And I have, I'm not against, hear me, we've got all kinds of denominations that are fighting against each other because this one believes this and this one believes this. And 90% of the time, they're both true. We've got to preach the full counsel of the Word of God. Not just point A, point B. We've got to preach the whole thing. We've got to be known as those that walk in this. We do realize, right, the Apostle Paul, could we agree that he was one of the mightiest men in the New Testament that's, that's lived? He did so much for the kingdom of God. Could we agree on this? You do realize he didn't have the New Testament, right? He was the writer of almost two-thirds of the New Testament. He didn't even have the King James Version. I mean, go figure. I don't know how he did anything without the King James Version. All he had was mainly the Old Testament. Yeah, at what point in time in his life were the Gospels written? I think the first one was written in AD 64, something like that. I think it was Mark, I think it was the first one. And so he would have been, he would have been. He had already been converted. Well, in preaching quite a while. For the first gospel. He preached out of the Pentateuch mainly and Isaiah. He preached out of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, not the Deuteronomy. And he took those five books and Isaiah and a few of the other prophets and he proved who Jesus was out of those. What Paul preached was all out of Old Testament. There was no New Testament. But today we have people that say we need to take the old and just throw it out and just stay in the new. Well, if you don't have the old, you don't know what the new is going to say. The new <coughs> is explained by the old. Yes, we're in a better covenant. I agree with all of that. But listen to me. It takes the old to prove that Jesus was who he says he was. Everything in the Old Testament was showing what was coming. It was the, 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 I heard the same the other day. It was the fulfillment of the old. Jesus was that. Everything prophesied in the old, Jesus was. 
I heard a saying the other day, the guy, that, the preacher that said it acted like it was a common thing everybody's heard before, but I had never heard it. It was, he said, the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. revealed. I've never it's heard it. It's been that. said a thousand times. It's a fulfillment of the Old Testament. It is. The New is the fulfillment of the Old. Yes, it is. Jesus was that fulfillment. <clears throat> The law showed us we couldn't do it. Jesus came to show us there's a better way. It's called relationship. It all boils down to relationship. Not keeping the, the law, so to speak, but keeping the commandments of, of Jesus. What did he say? You show you love me by keeping my commandments, obeying my commandments. What are the commandments? What's the first and the second? To love the Lord your God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. To love thy neighbor. How's that so? Andrew Jackson is not my neighbor. Neither is Mr. Benjamin Franklin. But yet, how many people spend their whole lives with these two fellows right here? And I didn't bother breaking it down. Fives, tens, and ones. We get the general idea. I don't have any thousand or ten thousand dollar bills, so it's about how I could go. Hundred dollar bill. How many people spend their whole life seeking this guy right here? How many people go to church but yet this really is our, our God? <coughs> Let me ask you this. How many pastors in America would rather have this over the presence of God? How many people in America would rather have this over the presence of God? Zero on your survey results. Yeah, if you took a <laughs> survey, yeah, that's, no, yeah. An idol, according to Webster's, is a, listen to this, an idol is a greatly loved or admired person. A picture or an object that is worshipped as a god. A representation or a symbol of an object that is worshipped a false god. I was sitting over there yesterday, and I, this had been going through me for several days, <coughs> this whole idol stuff, and I was, it was working through me and in me, and I was running with it. And it hit me just like you took that stick there and walked me upside the head with it. And when she got where she could come over, I told her, come sit down. Let me ask you something. And I asked her, what is an idol? She told me what her concept of it was. And we have a show in America called American Idol. If I asked you how many of us would we'll take this stick right here and come bow down and let's worship this stick together. Let's call out to this old great chestnut stick. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire, right? <laughs> old chestnut right here. Old chestnut. Old great and mighty chestnut tree. Would you help us? And we would all say that's just dumb and stupid. But yet by the gazillions of us in America, one of the highest rated shows ever is what? American Idol. The name of it. Idol. If I said this is an idol, we would say that's sacrilege. That's, that's just throw it out. That's stupid. There's nothing about this that can help us. It's just dumb. Burn it. It's nothing. We wouldn't bow down to this, would we? But yet, we take this thing here and we click this thing on and turn that thing on and oh look oh they're singing oh what does American Idol represent the show I'm talking about now the people that we we as a uh, nation idol on this how so okay hang on to that word you just said it's a competition to see who's going to be the next idol. 
idol in the sense of someone that we greatly admire. Greatly admired and some people worship. Now I wasn't alive when I was little. But I heard the stories of Elvis. I was actually at the Elvis concert when he came to Monroe. I was just inside my mama right there. Elvis came to Monroe and I heard the stories. How did how did the young girls respond to Elvis when he's up there singing? Was there any screaming and <coughs> fainting? Catching the scars he I went to a a banquet one time up, up, up the road here and they had an Elvis impersonator. And I watched these older ladies at a guy that wasn't even Elvis but was pretending to be singing like and trying or trying to sing like and, and they were swooning over this guy. And there were some people please don't come up here. Please don't come up here. He would bring his scarves through and lay them all and they were it was ridiculous. <laughs> American Idol. Have we ever stopped to even think about what that means? It has become part of our culture and now it's just American Idol's on. We're using the word that is an enemy of God. Remember, what is idolatry? It's the worship of something other than Jehovah. Than Jesus, right? And again, it's not going to say, all right, starting Saturday, we're going to, we're going to take this here stick and we're just going to worship God uh, through this stick right here. We're going to bow down to this here stick. So y'all bring your money and lay it at the stick right here. All right, here. Lay your money right there and say, oh, mighty stick. Help us. We have given you money. The priest of the stick is going to come take it. I do realize this happens every Sunday. And what I mean by that is we worship a form of God called church and not Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? We worship that steeple and we bring our money underneath that steeple when that plate comes by or that little bucket whatever it is oh we throw it in there and say oh we brought it unto God and the priest of that temple going to come and say oh thank you very much now y'all keep praying over there because what are we taught in America where do you feel the presence of God more than anywhere else at a church why because we're two or three are gathered together. But let me tell you something. That's what the Bible says, but it also says that wherever I go, lo, I am with you. Wherever you go to the ends of the earth, there I am with you. I don't have to go to a building to feel the presence of God. I don't have to gather with you to feel His presence. Yes, there is something that happens corporately, and I'm all about corporate worship. But let me tell you something. I don't have to go to a building to bring something to Jesus. But that's what we're taught. We have churchianity. And it's centered around that building or that pastor or that whoever. Well, those pastors will be gone one day, but the word of the Lord will still be the word of the Lord. Amen. I am concerned that we have taken buildings and we have taken Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4 there and we've turned it into idolatry. We're more concerned about buildings than we are the presence of God. There, now, now Mom, especially you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but have there been churches that split over the color of the carpet? Or the, where the piano is going to sit? What hymn are you going to What kind of pews we're going to Which have? Which hymn books we going to use and sing out of? Pardon? Hymn book. Which hymn book are we going to use? The hymn books. Oh, yes, there's always. Anything like that that can cause someone to have a difference of opinion. Are we going to have pews or are we going to use chairs? Are we going to use grape juice? Or are we going to use the real juice? 
Are we gonna? Are we gonna? And it splits. And it splits. It's so funny to me. You you go through the town and there's the first church or whatever, and then a little ways later there's the second church or whatever, same denomination. It's just a split off of that other one. It's just right down the road from the other one, and they couldn't get along with each other. And then there's another one of the same denomination, just a quarter mile up the road. It's a split off of a split off. And we become more concerned about our little fancy buildings where we have the presence of God. But yet we will get up and we will say, if we'll come in here and we'll come together, the presence of God will be here. If the presence of God is there, it's because we're there, not because of the building. We are carriers of the presence of God. The building, for some people, has become like this stick. That we can't feel God unless we're at the building. And if you take the building away from people, a lot of people wouldn't know what to do. Because we don't know how to feel God without our building. Are y'all following me tonight? Because it has become all about Mr. Franklin, Mr. Jackson, or Mr. Ben. Dead persons. It's become about them. And yet the money within itself is neither evil nor good. So Jesus said, but yet now today we have ATM machines in the lobby of the church. <coughs> we have call in. I, I saw this this week. You can now, a church, you can call in your tithe and offer, and they have a a code you just entered in over the phone now. I've even heard of direct deposit. As soon as your check hits, you can have it set up where a certain amount is sent directly to this other bank account for the church. There's all sorts of ways to get people to give. And we have centered it over giving and not the presence of God. It's not about this. It's about Jesus. Amen. But yet, it has become about this. People ask, yeah, I mean, as, as you often know, they ask all the time, how come we don't see miracles here like they do in other countries? Well, there's a whole lot of reasons, and I believe this is one of them. Because of that right there. It's right here. We like this. We like our church idolatry so much. As a nation, I'm really concerned if, if word came down tomorrow that all the church doors were to be locked and shut, what would happen to the church people? Slaughter away. How many of us just a few years ago would be that way? <coughs> how many of us, how many people do we know that if you take the building, this right here, you take the building away, we've now lost all form of relationship with Jesus because our relationship is built around this building. There's so many people who believe you can't be a Christian without a church. You can't be a Christian without a church. They closed all the churches and didn't let anybody go to a church. Christianity would just go away. To them, Christianity would exist. Because it revolves around I can't be a Christian. this. It's very I think true. You underestimate people. Very true. Do what? I think you underestimate people. There are a lot more Christians out there who do. If they shut the doors of the church, it probably the does. true church would come out. Yeah. We would lose a lot of the the ones that irritate us. That fluff and duff stuff, we would lose it. The people who go to church to balance the church. But here's the problem that I see with this, y'all. It's easy to spot that. It's easy to point fingers. 
But if we're not careful, we'll be guilty of the same thing in a different angle. Amen. There's the problem. We can become cynical. We can become high-minded. And we can think more of ourselves than we ought to think. And we've got to remember that we are nothing without Jesus. Nothing. We are nothing. And there's so many verses that I, I'm not going to get to, but uh, Leviticus 26, 1 Deuteronomy 4, 16, 23, 25, all talk about graven images. Uh, 2 Chronicles 33, 7, carved images, graven images, all so, so many. In Isaiah and Jeremiah and Habakkuk. It's, it's amazing how many scriptures there are. But how dumb would it be for us to trust in anything other than the pureness of Jesus? Let me ask that again. How dumb would we be to trust in anything other than the reality of who Jesus is? Than the relationship with Jesus. If we so want to show you, people... You, you, you made the point that we have Jesus. Old Testament, they had the promise. They did. But they didn't have... We'd see the promise fulfilled. We did. How much more difficult would it have been to live, to live back then? And I think that's why you see so many references to, to idolatry, because it was so easy to slip into it. It's still easy today. It, yeah, I mean we have it. We have it better, and yet we squander. We do. We have the realization of the promise. His name was Jesus. I mean, Hebrews tells us they were looking for it. It came. We had it. It's Jesus. But it's easy to let that become perverted. We've got to get to the pureness of who Jesus was. The reality that it's about Jesus. The reality of the pureness of who he is. And now to what Keith was talking about earlier, Galatians 5, 20. See, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says to flee from idolatry. But Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. Verse 19 says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, dispute, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the likes of these of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, Impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Greed. That's, uh oh. What was that? Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 tells us that greed is idolatry. That being said, how much greed is in America today? Let's take the church out of it. How much of it is in America? How much greed? Covetousness. The want for more. The need for more. The not being satisfied. How much is here in our culture today? Now how much of it is in the church today? How many people run the church like a business? Businesses say... And y'all can correct me again if I'm wrong here. But businesses say that once a building has been there for so long, that if you will build a new building, your 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 sales will go up immensely, like a Walmart, a Sam's, that type of thing. After so many years, Max just built a new grocery store. The parking lot stays full, doesn't it? Well, they, their sales went up to triple. They're telling me at least triple. New building right across the road, Bakewell, Angle, right across the road. Triple the sales because it's a new building. Fact is, new buildings bring people. Churches do the same thing. If it's where they can, they will build a new building every so many, 20 years, whatever it is, what happens? You build a new church building, people come. I told her the other day, you ready to start a church? All we got to do is go 
rent a rent a, a storefront somewhere, or build, put up a little tin building, we can fill that sucker up with people. That's all you got to do is get a good praise and worship leader. Cut this off. Trim up a little bit. Put my little clothes on. My little shoes, my little socks, my little khakis. We can build a church if that's what we want to do. We can bring people if that's what we want to do. And if God says tomorrow, then that's what I would do. But God hadn't told me to do that. And I'm not moving from where I'm at until God comes. Like over in Pakistan, I am not leaving until Rizwan shows up. <laughs> well, I'm not leaving until God says. But when God says, we got to step. We cannot let this be our driving force. For life. And I'm not talking about this church, I'm talking about in life. We cannot let this be our driving force of why we get up and go to work in the morning. We get up and go to work in the morning we provide for our families because we're doing what God told us to do. And we're going to do that until God speaks to do something else. We cannot let greed and covetousness run us. Saul lost his kingdom. A lot of people lost a lot of stuff of the greed and idolatry. <coughs> One more verse, Revelation 21 7. It says, Revelation 21 verse 7. It says, He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Verse 8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's a whole lot of people in that list right there. But that idolater thing, we look at it and we say, well, we don't have a shape of a man sitting in a little cubicle up here that we go and we bow down to. No, if we're not careful, we'll let something else get in our place in front of God in our life if we're not careful. My family can become an idol to me if I'm not careful. Anything you want to name in my life it can become an idol to me if I'm not careful. All I'm doing is asking you to check your heart, check yourself, make sure that there's nothing that stands in between you and God. Our Houses, our vehicles, our jobs, our families, our aspirations, our dreams, our whatever. Is there anything that stands between you and God? If it is, we must pull it out of there, repent, and put Jesus back in front of where he belongs. And we must keep him there. We cannot let anything, we cannot let religion become an idol to us. It's about relationship with Jesus. We cannot let buildings, we cannot let money, we cannot let anything. We must keep Jesus the primary thing in our life. Can you have an idol of time? Explain. We think of stewardship and we usually think of money as being a good steward. Do we tithe? Mm -hmm. Do we tithe our time? Mm -hmm. Are we a good steward of our time? Yes, when you think about what we are supposed to be doing if we're going to give God our all, are we giving Him our time? Yes, Love we got certain things set we're going to do, we're going to get involved in, and they're activities we enjoy, no harm in them, <coughs> but do they monopolize our time? Yes, ma'am. Why well, I ask, you got eight hours of work, eight That's hours right. of sleep, eight hours of something else. What are we doing with that? Because people will tell me I don't have time for <laughs> We make time for the things we want to do. That's right. And yes, we will stand held accountable before God for our time and what we did or didn't do. May God help us. May God help us. Yes, and me and Father. Shaitani Nimuongu. Jesus is king. And the devil is still a liar. Y'all be blessed in Jesus' name. Yeah. Church.